popular image of flying in World War I is of dashing young men fighting aerial battles full of glory and chivalry. Yet far below those pilots lay the true reality of the war to end all wars. The wretched indignity of the trenches with their mud, stench and rats where 10 billion soldiers lost their lives in four years as the two sides shelled each other across the fields of northern France without pity, day and night. No wonder so many men looked to the sky for an alternative. Life in the trenches in France was absolutely miserable. Quite apart from the Germans shooting at you by day and by night, we had to face the mud, we had to face the rats, but what we suffered most was the lack of space. We had to live, work, fight within a few yards, and all we could see between gaps in the sandbags was about two or three hundred yards of wire, umpteen shell holes, and very seldom saw the enemy. So whenever we looked up in the air and saw this fortunate um, maneuvering into the vastness of the sky, we were very envious. And when the army asked for volunteers, to transfer to the Royal Flying Corps to become either observers or pilots, a large number of us immediately applied for a transfer. This is the story of the cavalry of the air, the daring young men in the flying machines who were the eyes of the army. The Royal Flying Corps was formed in 1912 its main purpose to give the soldiers on the ground vital information. In lumbering, vulnerable biplanes, they constantly took the fight to the enemy, often spending two hours or more at nearly 20,000 feet. They took remarkable photographs, which identified the smallest change in position of an enemy gun emplacement. RFC observers took 88,000 negatives for one battle alone. Another duty was to bring down the German observation balloons, which, at the height of the war, were stationed at two-mile intervals along the front, 170 of them. The fighters, remembered more romantically than the observation aircraft, evolved to protect the slower machines. The, the, the duties were numerous and exciting. We had to take photographs of the front line. We had to uh, direct the fire of our batteries onto enemy targets. We had, which was very exciting to me, to bomb and machine gun German convoys or troops that we could see on the road. And what I think was particular to 8th Squadron, we were the first squadron to um, carry out experiment with the tanks. The tanks had rather restrictive visibility. And they were particularly vulnerable when they went up a small hill or a, hill or a big hill because they didn't know what was on the other side of the hill. And we as aeroplanes, as pilots, could go on the other side, see where these batteries, enemy batteries were, and bomb them and help the tanks that way. As the pilots carried out their soldiering duties over the battlefields, they endured constant danger from enemy fire. The pilots, so optimistic and patriotic when they arrived in France, were old at 19 and often dead before 20. Life expectancy for a pilot in the Royal Flying Corps in 1917 was down to two weeks. At best, the end would be swift. At worst, a slow death in a burning aircraft. Mind you, if aerial combat against the Germans looked like killing the flower of Britain's youth, it was a prospect only slightly more hazardous than the pilots' initial training. While some had the luxury of real lessons, many just had a book shoved in one hand and the joystick in the other. 
15,000 aircraft were lost in training. Most who survived to witness action did so because they had a strong sense of preservation and the makers had built the aircraft tougher than they looked. We had a three-cylinder, 35 horsepower Anzani in a single-seater job and we gradually, um, without any dual control at all, I had one ride around the aer aer aerodrome with um, the chap who ran the, ran the unit and um, about 400 feet and I made pleased with myself because I didn't feel dizzy or anything, it seemed quite nice. And um, without any dual control at all, I gradually got myself into the air. Um, I o always say that, um, that I held a book in one hand, which was written by a Frenchman, and, um, and the joystick in the other. And uh, as I went along, I read how, how you did. They didn't tell you much. I borrowed 75 pounds from my father and went to Hendon, the civil school. And there at Hendon, there were three schools down the apron. For, uh, Graham White School, they were employed teaching naval people. The London and Provincial School, the Beatty Wright School, and a fourth, the Raffi Beaumont School. I passed the Beatty Wright School and they longed to have my 75 pounds. The chief instructor there wanted me to f join that and took me up in a little Wright biplane. It had uh, an 80 horse rotary engine. Rotary is where the cylinders revolve like a Catherine wheel with a propeller attached to it on a crankshaft is stationary. And he said to me, Young man, you ought to learn to fly this aircraft. It's a wonderful aircraft, all out 35 miles an hour, dead man at 34. And for those who came through the rigors of training, it was off to France and the glories of battle. With just 15 hours of flying, the young hopefuls were launched into war. Some were so young that at any other time, they'd still have been at school. Yet there they were over strange, hostile land, covered in oil, cold, and woefully undertrained. I never lost a young novice. I always had the new boy alongside me in the formation with a trained pilot outside him again. They were bewildered. They couldn't see. I can't tell you why. Eyes just don't adjust. The experienced pilot can see way into the distance. The new pilot sees absolutely nothing. And he, he hardly knows what's going on around him. So um, I made a particular point in watching those fellows. But these are the fellows that were shot down. They were too easy. Both sides, probably. The experienced pilots lasted pretty well on the hill. When I got first over there, the CO, Major McLaren, he greets you and he says, well, Smith, if you can last the first 10 days, you'll be all right. We always lose out <laughs> new lads in 10 days. And he said, all I can tell you about that is to fly closer and let you see the Germans coming. And, uh, well, uh, I'm still alive. If you lasted 10 days, the eyes did focus and the nerve did harden. They had to because, at least in the early days, the British pilots were flying inferior, much criticized aeroplanes. Compared with the enemy, some of the machines British hopes were built on were slow, cumbersome, vulnerable, and short on firepower, like the BE-2C. Well, to, to fly, it was, like fly, it was like an old car, but um, it was... Um, no, not, not, um, it was very easy to fly, very, very um, stable. Um, it was about as easy as anything as we, we had. But um, for war, it was all cockeyed. It had the, uh, the, the pilot behind and the observer in front all mixed up in his um, flying wires and struts and things. And um, these Fockers used to come along with a steep dive and were particularly good at it. And uh, they, they, they had no feel of fire at all. I mean, um, the, the pilot um, w was probably an officer. Uh, that didn't make a difference anyway. anyway but um, in any case, the gunner had very little chance of doing anything effective. We came out 
with better aircraft later on, with the gunner behind, and he was very much more difficult to attack when well, the Germans had thought this out before. I had been on B-2Es and B-12s, and then I had to do my, uh, so many hours on my operational machine, which was the one you flew in France, and that was the RE-8, which we called Harry Tate. I remember sitting in the cockpit uh, on the tarmac, ready to take off, and my flight commander came up to me, and he said, now, don't forget, Johns, if you turn left, you catch fire, and if you turn right, you go into a spin. So I took off and flew straight on for a while, and then I happened to stall my machine and got into a spin, and landed wingtip and nose. I was very relieved because I hadn't had my breakfast, so I ran into the mess and got my breakfast and watched the ambulance going for the, to the wreckage of the machine. After that, let's see what happened. Do you know, it's such a long time ago, that one, it's more of a dream to one than anything else. The aircraft improved, of course, and so did the pilot's tactics. And even though it took those early aircraft over half an hour to get to 20,000 feet, the advantage of height was enormous in surprising the enemy. But height brought a new enemy, and there's only one way to describe it. Bitterly, bitterly cold, snow on the ground, frost. This was January, February 1917. And uh, we had covered all our faces with whale oil. We had face masks, goggles, big, uh, long gloves, boots, fleece. Fleece lined boots, long boots, well above the knee, fleece lined leather coats, and even so, it was jolly cold. Once I was flying about, about 12,000 feet uh, doing a reconnaissance, and my observer wanted to do something to either the camera or the gun. He took his gloves off. So cold, he was in hospital for next day for several weeks. Frostbite. We all were. Uh, touched with frostbite. Conditions on the ground in winter could be just as taxing as life in the air, especially if you were not an officer. I only uh, can tell you about the time that I went to um, France with the original expeditionary force. And of course, there were no camps. You just slept where you could, under the machine or, or anywhere else. Uh, and, of course, you, you never took your clothes off. In fact, when times did improve a bit, uh, when, when you took your socks off, you took the skin off your feet with them. There, there was no camp as such, because in those days, the, the, you could land in any field. It was harvest time, and they'd cleared the sheaves out, and the, the machines could land in, in a good-sized field. So you slept under the machine, if you were a machine mechanic. I remember on one occasion, uh, during the winter, waking up in the morning and the blanket lifted up as a solid board. It had frozen stiff with ice. That was part of our war. But pilots in the main were officers, and it was they who took to the air day after day. A popular music hall refrain of the day, Archibald certainly not, gave the slightly mocking nickname Archie to anti-aircraft fire but no such scorn was heaped on the guns of the German squadrons. You hear, hear pop, 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 you know, going off all the time, and you'd have a hit, you'd shoot at one and it'd get him out of the way. When he was out of the way, you'd have to look around and see nothing was on your tail and perhaps look for another. You got stoppages on them sometimes, but they're, they're very complex business. And this Cagliost crow, Firing through the propeller was the only way to shoot forward, and you'd blow your propeller off if we, before we had that on it. But as long as you saw that your revs between, say, 1,000 and 1,150, you were all right, you could use it. But you couldn't go blazing away as you liked. You've got to be very careful. If possible, I always prefer to attack from the back. I have sometimes had to attack from the side. <laughs> they allowed for deflection. In fact, the first, first German enemy aircraft I shot down was um, um, 
was from the from he he came right across me, and I just pressed the button. You see, as he went across, I didn't even know I shot him down until the pilot who was flying with me. This was on a sop with pup. We were on sop with pups then. Uh, t told me when I got back, he saw him go down, out of control. Actual dogfights, where enemy pilots would skillfully pursue each other to the death, were rare. In fact, dogfights were mostly scruffy affairs, often ending with both pilots running gratefully for home. Dogfights, uh, they came and they were over, and they were... They lasted a very short time, a matter of minutes, as a rule, nearly always. Mind you, uh, I don't mean to say that you wouldn't have another one in, in the so many more minutes. Some other, some other formation would turn up and you'd have a couple of dogfights in a quarter of an hour, something like that. But um, they were very short when they lasted. Well, a dogfight, you see, was when you, got, when you really got mixed up. The two, uh, the two sides got mixed up, the German, the enemy and ourselves. Well, you, you just had to, had to fight then. You couldn't do anything else. You'd realize he was shooting at you. You would see perhaps bits of your airplane coming away, or would see bits of his tracer past your ear. Uh, and you'd, the thing to do, if you could, was to get on his tail. And that's the one thing that we had to be able to do was to do a, a climbing turn. We'd do a climbing turn and round, or possibly a climbing turn at the top of it to a half roll, and try and get on his tail. And if you got worsted, the only thing to do was to, to, to uh, spin. Put your, once you put your aircraft into a spin, you were pretty well invulnerable. But you've got to remember that all the fighting took place well this side of the line. And there was always a strong, or generally, the prevailing wind was in the west, and quite strong. And uh, if you started spinning down in a dogfight, you had very little chance of getting home. The thought of never getting home was, of course, seldom far away, a fact sometimes used to cruel effect. But this fellow Cosgrove, he got interested with a young lady from the chorus of the Bink Boys of Broadway. And he was engaged to a girl in Canada. And this girl used to write passionate letters to him. So he came to me. He said, Jimmy, he said, uh, will you write a letter? I'll dictate it. How I'd die, you know. I say that we'd gone over the lines and I'm very sorry to say that we were attacked by the Germans and poor old Crossgrove was shot down in flames. He had a terrible death. So I said, I'm not writing that. Oh, no. So he, he wrote it backhanded. His, false, his handwriting took no end of time and sent it to this girl. And do you know, the next raid he was on, he wrote his death, exactly in detail. From the thousands who flew and fought and died in the skies over northern France, there emerged on both sides an elite. Men whose flying skills and marksmanship set them apart from the others. They were the aces. Perhaps the best remembered of all is the German Baron Manfred von Richthofen. He was a legend even during the fighting. Partly because he flew a bright red aeroplane, Partly because, unlike the reserved British, the Germans had a well-oiled publicity machine. Richthofen was unquestionably an accomplished fighter. He once said, after I have killed an Englishman, I am only satisfied for a quarter of an hour. Many of his 80 kills, though, were clumsy British reconnaissance aircraft, impotent against his squadron's firepower. I never liked Richthofen. I talked as a boy of 18, what do you know? But one has prejudices, one has feelings. He, he was a, 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 can you tell me the right word for bullshit? Uh, um, in, anyhow, he, um, he, he rather threw his weight about. He had a chap looking after his tail most of the time. And um, 
he was unattractive. They, they went for publicity, so did the French, so did the Americans, as hard as they could, and they made heroes all over the shop. And um, we were part of the army, said, well, we don't make heroes of all the chaps in the trenches, they want to make heroes of our flying chaps either. Anyhow, that's how it was. So these boys, these German boys were tremendous heroes. They made an enormous splash in Germany when, when that, that Jaster claimed to have shot down 200 um, enemy aircraft, that's us, in 11 months. But um, it's not appreciated that 56 Squadron shot down 200 aircraft in five months. Now, that's never known, you see? I mean, because we never publicized and never went in for this sort of publicity. Well, in 1917, certainly, when I had this offensive, what's called offensive patrols on an old one and a half strutter, I'd see up in the sky, when I went over perhaps 12,000 feet, up in the sky in the sun, always with the sun, Richthofen Circus. They were fighters, all painted wonderful gaudy colors, looping and rolling like a lot of puppies, waiting in the sun for us. And when they saw we were over their side of the lines, down they'd come. I worked out a maneuver. Directly they started diving. I gave the signal and we went around in a circle, chasing each other's tails. So all the six rear gunners could concentrate their fire on the descending Germans. And then I would move that circle very slowly round over, to, over our lines and get to the safety. But the trouble was, our youngsters, they came out from England very inadequately trained and uh, probably made a mess of their engine controls and couldn't keep up. And I used to say to them, if you lag behind, you're a dead boy. When Richthofen died, the Germans lost their biggest hero, and his death was marked by national mourning. When I saw him, I felt very sorry, because uh, he looked a typical uh, pilot of uh, age 20 to 25, uh, and um, I knew of his reputation and all his achievements, and I thought um, Peter would in get him as a prisoner rather than, than uh, being killed. We had our outstanding heroes too. Lieutenant Freddie West won the Military Cross and the Victoria Cross. His VC was for two remarkable episodes of devotion to duty in the summer of 1918. He was firing at enemy tanks when his aircraft was hit. He brought it down on the front line and ran to the tank commander to report the enemy's position. The next day, he was deep behind enemy lines when seven aircraft attacked him. His leg was severed, and he had to lift it off the controls. He was wounded in the other leg as well, but turned his aircraft so his observer could fire back. He nursed the aircraft home, landed safely, and when he regained consciousness, insisted on writing his report. Because when the uh, Canadian soldiers who rushed up to my machine uh, to try to get me out because I was bleeding profusely on my left leg. I asked them to get in touch with our squadron and tell them that I had some important information to give them about location of enemy troops. And they said, all right, leave it to us. And as a matter of fact, within a matter of uh, half an hour or so, an officer came and uh, I gave him the details of the location. Uh, and I always remember that uh, the fellow concerned said, well done, and forgetting that I, I was practically without a leg, he gave me a cup of tea for thanks. Other heroes who filled the front page with their exploits didn't survive the battles. They're not forgotten by those who shared those days with them. An ace, terrible word. Uh, the Royal Flying Corps was full of characters and individuals. And the great first one was Billy Bishop, whom I taught to fly in 1916. Billy was not a brave man, 
because the reason is he didn't know what fear was, and he was a remarkably fine shot. Edward Albert Ball, who was in the 60th Squadron, he was quite different temperament. He knew what fear was, and he overcame it. When he finished the patrol ball, he came down. All he wanted to do was two, one of two things, play his violin or go out and work in his little garden. Mick Mannock was a fine chap, wonderful shot, killed in a stupid aerodrome accident. And he was the one who developed fine tactics. He once said to me, Harold, my boy, remember one thing, he who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. And he said, yes, I always remember that. In those dark, hard days of 1917, every takeoff might be your last. But constant death didn't necessarily fill everyone with gloom. The morale of the squadron was wonderful. Great fun we had, we lived well, enjoyed ourselves. When there was a blank place, a table, because somebody had been killed, well, that's just too bad, so and so, he's gone west. And we just went on, play, somebody playing a piano and everybody singing, and perhaps having another drink. It, it was a, a great comradeship. If you compare the standard of living between the RFC and the infantry, there's no comparison. It was heaven. No more rats, no more mud, no more firing. You had a bed to sleep in. Amusingly, but sadly, whenever we had casualties, we immediately pinched the fellow's carpets or any little uh, uh, things he had agreeable in the hut and, and made our place even more comfortable. In the mess, you all sat like a tea. And as you arrived, you were at the bottom of the tea. Pilots on one side, observers on the other. And uh, as a person was shot down, you moved at one, the tea. Can you imagine this? And uh, the new arrival sat at the bottom of the tea. And I should say within six weeks, he was at the top of the tea near the CO's table. Most soldiers thought the RFC fought a cushy war because, if nothing else, they had a bed and a meal each night, presuming they survived to see nightfall. But it was the waiting for death which took its toll on air crew, particularly death by fire. It was nothing for pilots to have a dozen nightmares in one night. Many drank heavily, sometimes just before a patrol. But it was the faces of the young men which told the real story of the strain of flying intensely noisy, vibrating aircraft in freezing weather, starved of oxygen. Some were constantly afraid because they knew death was inevitable. Afraid? I don't think I can remember a second when I wasn't scared to death. But once I was in the air, I was fine. But going to the machine and just taking off, once I was up a few thousand feet, that was it. One was fine. And at night, you, if you had, you were kept awake at night. I was, but quite a bit, thinking of what might have happened during the period that I was up, do you see? And that didn't help either, because it took you a long time to get to sleep, you see? But in the mornings, you were generally all right. We used to have a lot of sing-songs at night. We had a chap who was uh, a most amusing fellow who would write words to all sorts of uh, old uh, songs, and uh, most indecent words for the most part. And we got to learn these, and we all shouted them out. Uh, we had a good deal to drink. Uh, we drank a lot, no doubt about that. We certainly did drink a great deal. Much more like, <laughs> like to think of now. More than people, I think, did in this last war. I suppose it was there, and he uh, you know, wanted to relax, and uh, you drank. I don't think it affected, uh, we were all pretty young, really. I could never fancy myself 
shooting the man in cold blood straight up to him or running a bayonet into him. I thought, that's no good for me. I must get into the Air Force or something where I can kill them without being seen. I couldn't, couldn't face doing it. I don't know whether I'm strange, but that's just my feeling, and that's why I joined the Flying Corps instead of the infantry. One day, when I was doing my circle of my one and a half strutters, I looked at the chap on my left, just in front of me, and I suddenly thought, hello, the, all the canvas on your f fuselage side has been ripped by a bullet, because there it was all just hanging down. Then I thought, what's that straw, bundle of straw? And I looked again, and the straw moved. It was the start of a fire in the petrol tank. And of course, a moment after, somebody came after me, and I was upside down or something after somebody. And I remember seeing just a flaming wreck go down and a little yellow coat. One of them obviously jumped out, turning over and over and over. And that's as near as I want to see men die. Every night, some RFC men experienced awful nightmares of going down in just such a flamer. Unlike every generation of fighter pilots since, these men had no chance to escape. Parachutes were only available to men in observation balloons. The powers that be reckoned a serious epidemic of cowardice might set in if they were given to pilots. No, we n none of us had parachutes, and nor did the Germans. Just in 1918, the Germans started, some of them, very few, having parachutes. But they were not what we call free parachutes, FRW free parachutes, which we have today, where you jump out and you pull the ripcord. They were like... An, uh, an umbrella rolled up into an umbrella case. And the, when the pilot jumped, the umbrella had to come and be pulled out of its case and then opened. Well, of course, probably, quite likely, some part of the aircraft would hit the pilot or the thing wouldn't unfurl properly. They never became into general use. And the free parachutes, such as we employ now, really started to start in the Royal Air Force about 1923. What, what you don't have doesn't worry you. Well, it's a very dis unpleasant idea of being burnt alive. Many people jumped, you know, when their aircraft was burning. The rumor was, uh, I don't know, but the rumor was that uh, most pilots took a pistol up with them because in the Flying Corps, you were not provided with air, with parachutes. And if your um, plane did catch on fire, it was a more pleasant alternative. A common image of the war in the air is one of mutual respect, that somehow the pilots of the Royal Flying Corps and the German squadrons were involved in a clean fight. For those who were there, the recollection is a lot different. Well, mostly, I would say, it's a lot of balls. Um, I think in the early stages of, of the war, 1914, perhaps the early part of 1915, they used to pot at each other with um, sporting rifles or something like that, and they would miss and they would probably wave and, um, and that sort of stuff. But um, <laughs> I never waved to a hand. If there was any chance of shooting him down, I did. And I know no one no, no, who would spare an effort to shoot me down if he could. I was flying a spad and we were circling from, a, you know, he tried to get above the other man and, and behind him. And suddenly I ran out of ammunition. And I was wondering what to do next, and to my surprise, the other fellow stopped firing. And we circled one, around one another. He had run out, apparently, he also run out. <laughs> And we circled one another, and he waved to me, and I waved to him. And he went back to Germany, and I went back to the front. I never saw, neither any of my colleagues, any acts of chivalry, either on the German side or our side. But I can give you a bit of experience about myself, because when I was uh, shot down, and uh, I was very badly wounded, the German pilot dived, or, on, my, on us two or three times, firing his guns to make certain that we would be out of action. Well, 
I have no ill feeling against this German power, because after all, what is war? You're going to war to kill your enemy. And this is what this German officer was trying to do. And um, as I say, I personally never, never witnessed an act of chivalry. So no love was really lost between the protagonists. But all these men were pioneers, and the common bond they shared was a love of flying. The lovely mornings when we used to go up early and fly above the clouds, and you saw this, it had this beautiful view of the clouds beneath you, do you know? And not far beneath you, because you just managed to get above them, to see this ripple, and so near each other that you felt you could walk out, you know, and just walk along on them. It was a wonderful feeling, that. But you couldn't, you see, because you'd have a drop of three or 4,000 feet. It's the most exciting thing to fly an aeroplane. You get, you see the world different. Down below you, you think poor mortals on their, their feet or motor cars or something. You get a feeling of moral superiority over the rest of, the, of, the, of mankind who doesn't fly. Once having been bitten by the joy of flying, it's with you for your life. These early pilots really were the first of the few. And should the horrors of war come again, as they did in 1939, then war in the air will once again be in the hands of just a few. was immediately applied for a transfer. This is the story of the cavalry of the air, the daring young men in the flying machines who were the eyes of the army. The Royal Flying Corps was formed in 1912, its main purpose to give the soldiers on the ground vital information. Lumbering, vulnerable biplanes, they constantly took the fight to the enemy, often spending two hours or more at nearly 20,000 feet. They took remarkable photographs, which identified the smallest change in position of an enemy gun emplacement. RFC observers took 88,000 negatives for one battle alone. Another duty was to bring down the German observation balloons, which, at the height of the war, were stationed at two mile... We had to face the mud, we had to face the rats, but what we suffered most was the lack of space. We had to live, work, fight within a few yards. And all we could see between gaps in the sandbags was about two or three hundred yards of wire, umpteen shell holes, and very seldom saw the enemy. So whenever we looked up in the air and saw this fortunate um, maneuvering into the vastness of the sky, we were very envious. And when the army asked for volunteers to transfer to the Royal Flying Corps to become either observers or pilots, a large number of chivalry. Yet far below those pilots lay the true reality of the war to end all wars. The wretched indignity of the trenches, with their mud, stench and rats, where 10 billion soldiers lost their lives in four years as the two sides shelled each other across the fields of northern France without pity, day and night. No wonder so many men looked to the sky for an alternative. A 
life in the trenches in France was absolutely miserable. Quite apart from the Germans shooting at you by day and by night. Intervals along the front, 170 of them. The fighters, remembered more romantically than the observation aircraft, evolved to protect the slower machines. The, the, the duties were numerous and exciting. We had to take photographs of the front line. We had to uh, direct the fire of our batteries onto enemy targets. We had, which was very exciting to me, to bomb and machine gun German convoys or troops that we could see on the road. And what I think was particular to 8th Squadron, we were the first squadron to um, carry out experiment with the tanks. The tanks had rather restrictive visibility, and they were particularly vulnerable. young men fighting aerial battles full of glory 